Martin Lipton of The Sun is with us. Good morning, Martin. Good morning. You're writing on the back page of The Sun this morning, it's carried in the Irish Sun, that the Big Six face orders to quit the Premier League by their rivals. What is the latest on this and how realistic is it? Well, there's a meeting of the uh, 14 Premier League rump uh, today being convened by Richard Masters, who's the chief executive. They are furious, angry, uh, incandescent, pick your adjective, uh, and some of them are vowing revenge. Uh, personally, I think it would be uh, both a difficult and indeed retrograde step. Uh, first of all, under the Premier League rules, you need three, to expel a club, you need a three quarter majority. Now, my math isn't great, but 14 is one short of a three quarter majority. I can't see any of the six voting to expel themselves, so that's not going to happen. Um, but also, more pertinently, if you get rid of the big six and replace them with the top six in the championship, and then you go to Sky and BT in October, as the Premier League is planning to do, to start negotiating the new TV contract, do you really think you're going to get £1.7 billion pounds a year? or even close. If you're lucky, you've got a third of your value in the market, if you're lucky. So therefore, wiser heads, I'm sure, will prevail. But that doesn't mean that the anger and indignation isn't righteous and justifiable. If you've been left out of this plot, you're going to be furious, and rightly so. Correct. Like, I mean, that, that's, we, we should leave that uh, aside just for one moment, that the fact whether or not this is right or wrong. But you raise a really valid point there. The, realistic ability of the Premier League to actually have influence on this is nowhere near what UEFA might be able to do. UEFA, with their international control, may be able to stop players playing for their country. We'll see what the legal standing is on this. But the Premier League will actually end up cutting off their nose to spite their face if they end up kicking out the big six. Yeah, it doesn't make any strategic or economic sense. I mean, the problem, of course, is that even if the big six stay, if this project Super League gets off the ground, and we have Perez saying last night in that strange interview he, he gave at about midnight, um, that he look, he's, he's looking to launch as soon as August. If not, then they will wait a year. Uh, there will be a flight of the money into the Premier League. I think um, people are telling me that even with the big six, a Super League would mean that the Premier League TV rights could drop by a third, because mm. that will be the new attraction for money. It will be the big pull. There's only a finite pot, and Super League will take a bigger share of it than the Champions League does. So that will be a concern. Uh, but Premier League has got to try do everything it can to m maintain its, its, its appeal. And the, the reality is, as Ian Ayres said a few years ago, and he was horrible when he said it, but it's absolutely true, without the big teams, there is no league. There has been some suggestion this morning, Martin, that one or two of the big clubs may now be wavering in their belief in the Super League. Would that then give the Premier League, I guess, the, the courage to actually go ahead and ban them? I know that they're not going to get 15 votes, but I think you're also reporting that Richard Masters essentially has an ability to supersede all of that and actually just pull the trigger himself. It's somewhere in the rule book. It may not yeah, happen. B, rule B11 gives the, the board, which is uh, Masters, Hoffman and Kevin Beeston, the power, absolute discretion to act as they see fit. But they've never expelled a club mm. before, and I genuinely don't see that as being a viable move for them. It doesn't make any sense, because also the, the repercussions would be enormous and the legal uh, threat that would follow. And were the Premier League to lose that case then, can you imagine the, the costs it would bankrupt the league? So... The smart move is to is what they can do under the rule book, which is to withhold permission for the six to play in another competition. But then again, that would itself, I suspect, be uh, you know put to, to test in a restraint of of trade uh, case being brought by the six, uh, who are as private companies have the right to to act in their own best interest. Indeed, have a legal and fiduciary right to uh, to you know. <clears throat> improve the lot of the shareholder to add shareholder value so there's lots of issues that will will come into it martin if the premier league's hands are tied on all of this how big is the player power going to be and the impact of the the more important managers in the premier league the ones that really really have the legacy and standing like klopp and pep guardiola probably more so than than Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. i would be amazed if pep guardiola says anything given that barcelona 
and Manchester City, two clubs closest to his heart, uh, are involved in this. Um, Klopp was in a difficult position last night and he decided that rather than actually saying what he believed, he'd turn on Gary Neville. I don't think it was a particularly smart play, but there you go. Um, Klopp doesn't believe in this concept sh clearly. He thinks he's wrong. Um, there is a danger, I think, if uh, Bayern Munich stay out, that this gives him an excuse to leave Liverpool and go to Bayern Munich, but we will see. I'm not sure that's necessarily in his mind at, at the moment. Um, we heard players last night. We heard Bamford. We heard Milner. We've seen quote, uh, tweets from the likes of Podense and Bruno Fernandes uh, and others. But this is all based on this threat from UEFA in particular and FIFA to, to ban the players from international football. The clubs simply don't believe it. They think it's an empty threat. And their argument is, OK, do that. And when you go to market the World Cup, and say to Budweiser and Coke and McDonald's, yeah, we've got this brilliant tournament with all the world's countries taking part. Oh, no, 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 we haven't got Messi and we haven't got Ronaldo. Uh, no, no, we haven't got Kane and we, we haven't got Salah. No, I haven't got Mbappe. No, no, but we've got the bloke who plays for Atalanta and the middle for midfielder. Hmm. Yeah. Where's that argument going to get? Where's that money going to come from? Well, it would mean that Ireland would win the World Cup, so it would be great. Well, there you are, brilliant. Uh, like th th that is, it's really, it's a really interesting point, though, Martin, because that's where the divide between UEFA and FIFA might start to emerge. We were making this point yesterday morning that if one of the two big governing bodies is going to come on side with the Super League, it's probably going to be FIFA. UEFA at least have to protect the Champions League, but FIFA, as you rightly say, they're just thinking about the World Cup. And also the Club World Cup, which is probably more important. I, mean, I don't know if you remember, I did an interview. Uh, a couple of months ago with Javier Tabas, who accused Infantino of orchestrating this breakaway plot with Perez. He said straight out, he said, it's, it's, this is Perez and Infantino. Uh, Infantino will be speaking to the UEFA Congress in the next hour and a half. He has told Alexander Sefrin that he's going to back him and fully supports UEFA stance and is utterly opposed to this Super League project. But the FIFA statement that came out just before midnight on Sunday was at best limp. Mm tepid, wishy-washy. It was not the full-throated condemnation of the plans that UEFA were anticipating and expecting. And there's an awful lot of interest now in what Infantino says in the pulpit of the UEFA Congress, because if he goes soft on Super League, the clubs who already think he's leaving the door ajar will believe he's left it wide open. That's game set and match, Martin, really, isn't it? This Infantino well, stance. And the argument being that Infantino has always wanted to emasculate UEFA, uh, loathes Seferin, really hates the pact that Seferin has formed with Dominguez in uh, South America and would love to put him, uh, put him away. Also, by encouraging a Super League project, it gives credibility to his World League scheme and also his Club World Cup. Now, I'm not sure whether this is true, I'm not saying that it's fact, but this is the allegation, the insinuation, the, the fear of some, that actually Infantino may be the, the game changer in the wrong way. What he says, as I said, in about an hour and a half will be fascinating to watch. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's going to be key. Like, then it comes down to what might happen within, if any of the Big 12 can find it within themselves to publicly say, actually, you know what, we're wavering a little bit on this or we're changing our mind. Do you see that as likely at all? And, and if so, Martin, who do you think might be the most likely to do so? Well, we know that Chelsea and City were, slight, were reluctant followers rather than leaders of this. Uh, even on Sunday, I was being told that City were the last to sign up. And you could argue, well, didn't they have the courage of their convictions? Well, no, they, the problem was fear of missing out. But nobody wants to miss out. They don't want to turn their back on a share of £4.6 billion. And I'm not sure that any of them, having come this far, can individually pull out. Now... Maybe if there's a caucus across four countries, three countries that do, it would be different. But Real Madrid, Perez has nailed his colours to the mast last night. We believe that Atletico and Barcelona are in line with them. Agnelli can't change his position unless he gets booted. But, you know, unless Juventus boot Agnelli, they're absolutely all in. Even Gazidis is a senior plotter at, at Milan. Uh, Inter also in. Liverpool and United drove this, so they're not going to pull out. Who are you looking at? Spurs and Arsenal need it to keep 
solvent, you know, not quite as bad as that. But look at the money that the Spurs have lost because of uh, 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 more than anyone, because they get six million pounds a, a match in income revenue it, it, from games. This would fill a huge void. They're going to get two hundred million pounds straight up, plus one hundred and thirty million pounds a year, whether they win or or lose any game. Even if they lose every game, it's one hundred and thirty million. Plus for Tottenham, this is fifty five million extra revenue through the gate every season. And we do want to talk specifically about Tottenham for footballing reasons, obviously, after yesterday. But just one on them in the Super League. Like, if Tottenham fans were a little bit annoyed by this, Martin, that the very existence of the Super League might be coming over the next couple of months, they'll be doubly pissed off when they see that they're actually the butt of everybody's jokes. That everybody making uh, barbs about the Super League online is saying, what are Spurs doing in here? Well, that the Spurs were in the Champions League final 18 months ago. Yeah, you, you... Spurs, which were the first team in England to win a European competition and have won more European competitions than Man City and, Ars uh, and Arsenal. That's Spurs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just saying what people are saying online, Martin. Just the, 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 troll, the trolls on Twitter. If we all listened to what people <laughs> said online, we'd never get out of bed, would we? But, uh, like people are saying they haven't won a league since 1961. 1961, I know, it's true. But they've also <laughs> been in the top four. They, they've beaten every team in the league in the last, in terms of positions in the last three years they've been in the top six for 10 years running they've been in the top four for most of those years they've been second and third they've been in european finals and also more pertinently and this is what it boils down to they're the eighth richest club in the world i think that's uh, the bulls are right there uh, neil go ahead yeah martin i suppose we might actually just flip it on to the news of jose Mourinho yesterday oh no <laughs> <laughs> incredibly, incredibly buried by the uh, by the Super League news. I suppose there's a couple of strands on it. It was probably something we all expected was going to happen at some point in the next few months. Were you surprised, though, that it was yesterday, a few days out from a cup final and not at you know a later stage during the summer? Yeah, for me, the surprise is the timing, not the fact. I think it's become inevitable now um, that it couldn't last. Uh, things were falling apart. The centre cannot hold, and as famous Irishman once wrote. And um, the truth is that there was nothing there anymore. The board, I'm told, were increasingly worried and concerned. There were issues about discipline within the squad in terms of commitment to the team and the club that they blamed the manager for. Uh, and performances have been ropey at best, shocking in the main part. The view within the, the, the board was that something had to be done. It couldn't be changed without significant alteration. The only obvious change is to get rid of the manager in these circumstances. The belief is that this will allow Delhi and Bale to get come back into the fold immediately because they're still two good players who shouldn't be being wasted and left on the sidelines. Uh, they think that this will galvanise the squad and maybe allow them to pull off some sort of freak, freak result against City on Sunday and still get into the top six for Europe if they're not banned by UEFA for next season. Yeah, I think almost any conversation about getting into Europe now has a little asterisk beside us when we're, when we're going through it. But is there, like, is there an element that it was uh, just giving themselves enough, enough little wiggle room left in the season that, as you can kind of say, they can, they can hopefully get some kind of a bounce and... Could that be enough, maybe, to keep Harry Kane at the club uh, over the summer? Uh, I think that my, my my belief, and I know nothing on this, my belief is that what they will do is uh, bid a fair, a sad but fond farewell to Hugo Lloris and say to Harry Kane, here is X extra per year and we want you to be captain and give it one more year. And if you feel the same, then we understand. But we need also, because if you give it one more year, you have the, the ideal platform to become the record scorer in Tottenham's history, supplanting Jimmy Greaves, because he's only 30 off behind. And he, you know, he scores 40 goals a season in all competitions. So that may be their push. And who knows, with a new manager, and I think Nagelsmann is absolutely number one choice. Um, he's the one they want, whether they can get into another matter. But they're obviously going in now to try and get him before... Bayern Munich do. Um, it would be interesting if Nagelsmann turns down uh, Munich to join Spurs and Klopp then takes the opportunity to go to Bayern, but we will see. But they need... Uh, it, it, Kane is huge. They can't afford to lose him because of what it will say about the, 
the ambitions and, and status of the club. They know that. Uh, at the same point, I think a lot of Spurs fans who would be horrified to see Harry Kane go would not blame him if he tried to. But so far, he hasn't forced the issue at all. And that will be the, the hope. Oh, well, I would say, of course, as, um, as a warning to Tottenham fans, is Daniel Levy's first act as uh, chairman was to sack a manager to try to keep the star player. Within three months, Sol Campbell had gone to Arsenal on a free transfer. Oh. <laughs> that, that's a prospect and a half. Um, I'm not saying that Harry Kane's going to go to Arsenal, by the way, but, you know... <laughs> You just That's leave that hanging out saying, there. But it is a fact that he got rid of Graham, brought in uh, Glenn Hoddle, you know, got rid of George Graham, brought in Glenn Hoddle, believing that that would keep Campbell, and he didn't. You mentioned Nagelsmann there. Obviously, the, the timing of this sacking is coming just a couple of days after Hansi Flick confirmed that he's going to be leaving at the end of the season. Do you think that played a part, that they saw what was happening at Bayern Munich, the fact that probably their long-term target was going to be looked at as well for a job like Bayern Munich and they felt like they had to kind of move quick? I'm sure it's a fact too. In addition to the fact that the performances have dropped off a cliff, the Everton performance despite the result was terrible. The Man United performance, the second half was abysmal. So it's, it's a, co a combination of, of factors. But yeah, if, if Nagelsmann's the one you want and you fear you might lose him, then you may have to make an early move. And uh, Dave Kidd in my paper today thinks says that they could even install the German by by the end of the season. Um, that isn't inconceivable. I'm sure if they really, really want, that's their, their plan A and they throw enough money at it, it is possible, yes. Have you thought about the context of Harry Kane's future when it comes to the Super League, Martin? Like, does that make him more or less likely to stay if there's a Super League come August? Well, if there's a Super League, there's only 11 clubs he can go to, isn't there? Yeah. Um, and I don't think he'd leave. I don't think... I, I genuinely do not believe that Daniel Levy would sell Harry Kane to another English club so he can only go abroad. Theoretically, this might make it more more likely um, because Bayern, sorry, um, Real and Barcelona, who obviously are somewhat cash-strapped, might suddenly believe they've got more money they can afford to, 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 to spend. Um, who knows? I mean, it's, it's a bit of a difficult argument to d discuss because we genuinely sure. don't know whether this is going to happen. And we know that Perez has said it could start in August. I find that difficult to believe in truth because I'm not sure they get the deals over the line in four or five months. But this is a, 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 a rapidly evolving situation and scenario, which means that anything you say uh, in the moment could be completely out of uh, uh, out of date by the end of the day. So it's a bit too it's a bit too fluid at the moment to be truthful. By the end of the hour, Martin, to be quite honest with you, every single minute is important at the moment. Um, just one last one then. Jose, wh where does he finish up from uh, studying him closely over the last couple of seasons? Wh where does where does he go next? I genuinely don't know. Um, I don't think another English club will take him. I think that's gone. So he's still revered in Portugal. Could he go back to Porto one day? Could he do Benfica and, you know, go back to where it effectively started for him when he only lasted a year before he quit? Could he take the Portugal job after the Euro vote? He's 58. Does he fancy that sort of thing? I don't think he'll want an international football job yet. I think he'll still want a club job. What would that be? You know, he's still revered at Inter, but that's gone. But maybe he could be the man to revive Juventus if they feel that they need a change. Maybe... Um, Marseille might decide that he's an option. I, I genuinely don't know, but I can't see another English club taking him. What I would say um, is that he has behaved in a way that I didn't expect at Tottenham. When it was all falling apart, he's actually been, by his standards, very well behaved. He hasn't, I don't think, gone on the mad assault and a, an aggressive stance that he did at, at Chelsea and, and United when it was falling apart, but it didn't stop it falling apart. Um, and it looks like the lust of the magic has waned and maybe gone for good. We can't forget what an astonishing managerial figure he was for the first 15 years of his career. Uh, truly remarkable and did things that very few have been capable of doing. So for me to see him somewhat diminished has been, been quite sad because I remember there were moments when I saw the twinkle and the glint in the eye. 
but they weren't there for long enough. And he did look reduced in the last few months, almost as if he was, you know, bringing this on himself because he doesn't really enjoy it anymore. And he used to love it. Yeah, it's pretty sad, actually. He seems to have mellowed in both a positive and a negative way, it seems, over the last little while. Martin, great stuff as ever. Thanks, million, for taking the call this no morning. No worries, take care. Bye-bye. Martin Lipton there of The Sun and uh, reporting this morning that uh, the big six are in trouble.